right. Welcome, Sebastian. <laughs> and we have a third guest. This is Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. We uh, have a dog in my company, so we have a dog in my company. <laughs> <laughs> so last year you came out, you brought a birthday cake. Yes. For Laura. Uh, so this is my gift, right? Yep. <laughs> this is the, the, the dog that loves to eat cake. <laughs> uh, but really, <laughs> you guys have a lot of actual news today, too. Uh, Udacity has introduced some, some new programs today. Do you want to give us a little bit of a breakdown of what you guys are, are revealing today? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, our mission, of course, is to kind of get everybody great education. And we've been so blessed that top companies like Google, we just heard about this, and, and Facebook and so on, build education programs. I bet there's a whole bunch of people here taking Udacity classes. Probably. And a show of hands, yeah? Oh, yeah, we got a few. I can tell you, when we did self-driving cars as a program last year, I expected maybe 20 people to sign up. And we got almost, almost 50,000 applications by now. Um, the, the latest thing is going to be flying cars. And it's completely crazy. No one in the world believes in it. Uh, <laughs> but believe I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. But I think it's kind of, there's so much activity now in the drone space. Um, many of you have companies in that space. It's great being in that space. And then also the flying car space. That we just felt we should teach crazy shit, honestly. Um, stuff that no one else teaches. So that anybody who wants to have a job in the space is ready when the jobs come. Great. So w what kind of stuff is that crazy stuff that, that you, uh, people aren't teaching? Like, what, what are people not getting in the traditional uh, programs? That, that so I think what's happening is in, in Aero Astro and computer science in the past, if you cared about flying, you would go to an Aero Astro department and you'd be militarily sponsored and you would either on fighter jets or on very large scale aircraft. And that field has basically come to a halt because of regulations. So if you want to build a plane today, uh, it's going to take you 15 to 20 years to build your plane, yeah. and maybe a billion dollars or more. Even the latest Gulfstream, which is this minor modification from the previous Gulfstream, was like multiple billions of dollars. And then there's this great new stuff, like Jeff Bezos is pushing, uh, pushing it, and, 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 and Larry Page about uh, drones and, and deliveries. And that requires a completely different approach, because now we might have like tens of thousands of things in the air at the same time. Right. So our airspace management doesn't work. We need AI. We need controls. <laughs> and I need help here, Shanaz, please. <laughs> because um, my dog gets very active when I say this. Um, so, so to put these things together, like modern controls, deep learning, artificial intelligence with aerodynamics, flight, materials. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, He's too hyped up on <laughs> flying cars. <Yes>. Right. <laughs> I think, I mean, if I look at Silicon Valley, it's, it's so wonderful to be here and see these trends before anybody else sees them. Yeah. Right? I'd say self-driving cars are very hot right now. About three years ago, no one cared about them. And I would say three years from now, flying cars will be very hot. And they might actually disrupt the self-driving car. So as you'd ask, we're trying to stay on top of this. And as Kitty Hawk, we try to invent this. Right, yeah. Can we talk a bit about Kitty Hawk, actually? So how are yeah. things going over there? What's the, the latest update from Kitty Hawk? Boy, uh, we're still mostly in stealth mode, except that occasionally Reporters like Brad Stone write about us when we don't you want to. You send out some videos now and again. That's not very still. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Uh, we actually believe we have our first product ready in February next year. Yeah. And it's more of a, like a flying motorcycle than a flying car. So it's, it's a fun event, fun thing to fly. Right. I've flown it. I'm still alive. <laughs> um, it's, I would say, the funnest thing I've done in my life in terms of physical things. Um, but the vision, the vision of, of, of the company is, and I think many of you share this vision, um, that we should fly every day. Um, there's no reason why, we, why we, we're stuck in traffic anymore or that we could fly. And it's not just true for packages. I mean, drone delivery is a good example. Uh, it's very hot right now, but it's also true for people. I mean, I don't want to... I mean, with a flying vehicle, I could make it from Palo Alto to San Francisco in about 10 minutes and oh. pay about half a dollar of, of electricity. But that's still... A minimum a decade away, right? Before that's practical, or when people say it's a decade, that's typically two years away. Honestly, oh really? There's, there's no technical reason why it can't be done. It's much more of a societal reason. Yeah. Uh, so, would you advise entrepreneurs working now to start to focus on that? Like, is that a thing that you could get with enough runway with funding? I mean, become a direct competitor of me? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But if you think about, I mean, I, I love thinking about the world as this playground where almost anything interesting has not been invented yet. And if I ask myself how will we look in the future, then I can't envision a future where we still have highways stuck with cars. I envision a future where you hop on your thing, you go in the air, fly somewhere on a straight line, 
you're safer than on the ground, you're faster, you're cheaper. I envision a future where Amazon delivers my food uh, through the air mm. within five minutes from the restaurant to maybe my, my dining table, and, and where this is also faster and safer. The air is so free of stuff and it's so unused compared to the ground. Um, it has to happen, in my opinion. What about, what about the, just because we're on this subject, what about the, like Musk's vision of, of going under instead? He seems to think that has fewer barriers. I, I, I think we should try everything. Um, the reason why I'm not personally invested in, in Hyperloop is because of the infrastructure costs, mm -hmm. right? So digging tunnels is expensive. So if we can accomplish the same in the air, I, I'm not a fan of the California high-speed rail. I think it's a big mistake for right. the state and for the country, and it's never finished, obviously. But the reason is we have a fundamentally great mass transit system between Los Angeles and San Francisco called airplanes. Mm -hmm. They work very well, they're more energy efficient, they're safer than rail, uh, there's no infrastructure required. I have no clue why we move backwards in the state <laughs> as opposed to forwards. Right. All right, uh, what about uh, self-driving cars then? You obviously, I think, very often called the godfather of self-driving cars, but uh, uh, how does that fit in with a future where, where you've got autonomous drones or autonomous aerial vehicles flying around? I think, I mean, I'm, I've been amazed by the interest, and one of our announcements today is that we have an introduction to self-driving car, none of the degree that, that it's anybody with a weak coding skills to, to participate in this. Um, we have, at this point, I think our existing self-driving car in degree hasn't even finished yet. There's no graduates. And over 60 people already found jobs in companies like Ford and Volvo and many other companies. Right. Um, it's great to see the activity. I, I'm a, a firm believer that we have to have self-driving. We have to have self-driving specifically in connection with ride-sharing mm -hmm. because then we can cut the American cost of transportation by about a factor of two in my calculation. But then that doesn't stop us from innovating beyond self-driving. I right. think transportation itself is just so archaic today we kill 1.2 million people every year on roads. It's not acceptable to me. We spend a lot of time waiting in traffic, not acceptable to me. So I think we should just try everything. Great. Talking about that program, so how did that come about? Like you, you introduced the self-driving car nano degree last year here on stage, I believe. So right. why now an intro course? What, did, what were you guys saying about, about that that required this introductory course? We got almost 50,000 applications for this, which, which makes Udacity in terms of educating self-driving car engineers, bigger than all universities combined. But we also found in the applications that many people wanted to be part of it that didn't have the prerequisites. And the prerequisites are stiff. Uh, if you're in it, um, I, I admire you, God bless you, it's hard. It's not easy. Uh, so we, we, we wanted to get to those people we couldn't admit into the program and say, look, here's something you can do to get admitted. You need to learn about machine learning, about basic control theory, about math, about object-oriented programming. Mm. And when you get this chunk together, then you have the basis to enjoy yourself in the more advanced career-driven self-driving car degree. Great. And you also have, uh, that, that's sort of like a technical requirement, a limitation, but uh, you, you're partnering with Lyft uh, on this, and Lyft is providing some full scholarships. So that's more about opening up access in a different way. Can you talk a bit about that? Or? Well, we had a, a long history of getting scholarships from com companies like AT&T and, and many others. And we have a long history of, of teaming with tech companies to develop curriculum, and this is no exception here. But Lyft has been so kind to put on the table 400 scholarships, mostly focused on minorities and diversity, which I completely endorse. They are also a hiring partner, so they are one of the entities that have a rapidly fast-growing team of self-driving car engineers, and they're desperate, like everybody else. I mean, last year I made the quote that if you look at the recent acquisitions, a self-driving car engineer is worth 10 million, 10 million bucks. And I don't think it's worth less today than last year. Right. And that's not, so that, like, that opportunity is not going away. Those positions are not being filled, right? Like, there's still no. growing demand? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge gap. And I'm sure all of you feel it in your own field. If you, if you look at what you're hiring, like machine learning, Android, self-driving cars, controls, deep learning, if you compare the type of people that apply in your job, they might be doing Ruby on Rails, or they might be doing something else. So what we've been trying to do is really kind of fill this gap and, and get this talent where it's needed. And, it's not that people lack smartness, it's just that our education system is so slow and so rigid mm -hmm. that even if you graduate today with a computer science degree, you often don't even know how to program, say, an Android or iOS or how to do deep learning. Right? That's where Udacity comes in as hopefully providing some benefit to everybody that we can teach, like we taught, I think we taught deep learning today, TensorFlow came on the market. Mm -hmm. um, we can turn these things very rapidly around and reach everybody in the world uh, with those new skills. We 
when you talked about the hiring partners and, and some of the other scholarship providers, so a lot of that seems to be filling needs from larger companies or from existing companies, but how much of Udacity's focus is on like building skills that are for startups or so that people can go found their own company? Many of our, our students start companies in, in all around the world, and many startups have hired our graduates, uh, and, and we often we put them together with startups. We have a, this career site where we can look at our students. I think there's something like more than 10,000 people available looking for jobs or having looked for jobs. Um, and we find that, that there's often very good matches. The biggest obstacle, I should say, is the following. And it happens in my own company, and it's really sad, which is when it comes to hiring, people get very risk averse. Mm. Um, the, the cost of hiring a person is actually quite high because you have to bring them in and maybe get them a visa and a sign-up fee. And, and if it doesn't work out, firing is really hard. And I encourage everybody to fire actively. It's actually a good thing to do, but it's very hard. Go to ahead and fire somebody today. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then people, including in my own company, you would say publicly, oh, we, we, we built all these great careers. I mean, we hire our own engineers, they have to be from Stanford. And I would go to my student, like, like, what do you think? Like, why, why do we hire people only from MIT internally to Udacity if we externally proclaim we're changing the talent landscape? And it took me a long time to break through this internally and get ourselves to basically hire our own people, which is much less easy than it might sound, right? right. And then we found that the people we hired were actually great. I'd say a Stanford student is probably someone who's been great and protected their entire life, and they made it to Stanford, and God bless them. Our students often have a prior career, did something else, so they're not as streamlined. On paper, they don't look, don't look quite as good often. But when it comes to ambition and it comes to resolution, oh my God, the people we hired from our own network blow away pretty much everybody else. Really? Now, what about, how does that balance out with uh, the traditional education? Like, how do you see Udacity position versus uh, a traditional college education where you might have more access to a more well-rounded kind of experience? And, yeah. and is there a place for one or the other? Do you ever see Udacity kind of replacing the, the one? I mean, entirely? in the beginning, some of you who are a little bit older might remember when the MOOCs came out, the massive open one. Oh, courses. I remember books. Yeah, I've heard The, the big pitch was, we're going to destroy college, and we haven't destroyed college yet. Uh, <laughs> Should have a t-shirt destroying college since 2011. Um, the reality is they're very different. Um, the, um, the typical Udacity student is 24 years older, international, uh, has no access to top-notch education, um, and is, is aspiring. It's an innovator usually because we're still in the, in the early adoption phase of, of education, sad to say. Um, what, what is happening, however, is that I think the world is moving from a one-time education to a lifelong education. We can't afford a single education anymore. I mean, you know this as entrepreneurs, but wait, talk to your parents <laughs> who have a single education. Um, the world is moving so rapidly that I, I believe the future of education ought to be that we become lifelong service providers, like your cable company is lifelong service provider, your water companies, your universities are not. Your universities are like a cable company that says you watch cable for five years, let's switch it off and go away. <laughs> and the only thing I accept from you now is donations. Yeah. And I, I give that spiel to every college president. I just hang out with Ralph Rye from, from, from MIT last week and say you could be the biggest university on the planet if you just became a lifelong university. But they just don't see that. Right. They just don't see this. It's good for me as a business because it means there's an entire gap of people who have no service provided and I can just pick them up and teach them. Great. Uh, talking about AI, Jordan set that up, but uh, also like this, you have so many things that you do. <laughs> it's amazing. You're doing flying cars, you're doing autonomous cars. Uh, you're also doing medical research. So there was a, a journal article published in Nature beginning of this year, uh, some Stanford research. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, we're very lucky. Um, and and this, this, this article has been overhyped and I openly admit <laughs> this, but it was a study where we uh, used deep learning, TensorFlow, to see if we could classify skin patches into cancerous and non-cancerous uh, using AI. And my students, um, uh, Brett and, and Andre, uh, collected 129,000 images of skin conditions, all classified, all um, biopsied, so ground truthed, into about 2,000 categories. And of those, we looked into carcinomas and melanomas and came up with a typical AI result, a certain number of, of false positive and false negatives. Mm -hmm. And then the shocking thing is we wanted to to compare this to a human doctor, so we went to a person at Stanford who's a dermatologist, like he makes about half a million dollars a year, and said, hey, can we compare you? And we were like light years better. Really? And then we got our juices flowing and we compared to over 20 doctors, all Stanford level, board certified dermatologists. And by and large, um, AI just beats them. By and large, an iPhone can do a better job finding skin cancer. 
the, the reason why um, many of you are in this field, it's, it's, it's not easy to build a medical startup, um, but the reason what excites me about this is I think we can take any repetitive office job, like any accountant job, any lawyer job, um, actually to some extent any CEO job is 80% repetitive, mm. turns out, and probably build AI to make us 10 times as, as efficient not akin to the revolution that took place like 300 years ago when we invented the steam engine and, and more recently like 120, 130 years ago when we, we, we turned farmers into non-farmers because we made machines that made people like 100 times as strong. I think now we're building machines that make people 100 times as smart. So now, currently, the, or like yes, in the near future? at this moment, we're in the middle of it. And many of the companies I see outside, Focus on AI, do this. It's going to be the biggest disruption ever in modern history. Because so, as I mean, 75% of us work in offices doing stupid, repetitive stuff, including medical doctors. I do the same. I make a lot of gifts, which is uh, pretty repetitive, actually. So yeah, I would, I would like a computer to do that job for <laughs> Yeah, I do. I mean, as CEO, I, I give the same speech over again. I have the same hiring process and firing process and all these things. And yes, I wish an app could do all this stuff for me so I could be more creative. Great. Um, so I think then this kind of ties into it, but we have this audience here. They're obviously entrepreneurs that, you know, I'm, I'm sure they get tired, as you told me backstage, of hearing people talk about how successful they are on stage. <laughs> so do you have any advice for how you get through that hard part, like the, the panic and the, the fear and the terror that goes with being an entrepreneur? I, I think the, uh, the, the fear is completely overrated. Um, and if I had one, one modification of the human brain, I would like to cut out this little part that, that's called the fear zone. Because you want to I mean, turn it off. First of all, I, that's the premise of many horror movies. First, first of all, I, I'd argue, I'm, I admire everyone here who tries. I mean, you're so much better than the people who don't try. And then the second thing, I mean, I talked to Astro Teller recently, and Astro asked me the question, "How long would it take you to rebuild Udacity?" And I said, "Probably a year." And he said, "How old is Udacity?" I said, "Well, it's six years." Mm. So see, look, five years, you did the wrong thing. And only for one year, you did the right thing. So most of the stuff you did was wrong. And I started thinking about this and say, that's pretty wise, pretty insightful, because every time I do something wrong, I'm in pain, obviously, right? Yeah. But the reality is, it's a learning process. All of you are climbing a mountain that's never been climbed before. There is no blue book. There is no right or wrong. So as you try your best thing and it fails, you learn. And if you understand how important learning is, if you celebrate learning, then every, time, every day is a success. And that's something to keep in mind. You get so much smarter than anybody else in that process. And, and I personally, I love that. I love the, oh my God, I have no clue what's going on. I love to be um, a CEO of a company where I have absolutely no technical insight, um, so I can't even have an opinion. And then try things out. It's, it's literally spaghetti thrown in the wall. But it's a positive thing because that's how, how, how knowledge is generated. So I encourage all of you, when this comes and you feel really bad about yourself, you should feel good about yourself, you should celebrate. Any mistake you make is actually great because you're never going to make it again. Great. Uh, just one last question before we go. You guys also announced today that Danica Patrick is going yes. to be the uh, spokesperson, I guess, for the, for yeah. the self-driving car program. So why choose someone who is like an excellent manually driven car professional to represent a program that's all about automating car driving. <laughs> Danica is amazing, and, 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 and she is literally fearless, and she has written world history with what she's accomplished, honestly. Um, I, I, want, I want role models in Udacity of amazing people, and she, she's a person I would look up to. Um, I also, I mean, one of my big pushes internally, externally, is, is to promote diversity, not just gender-wise, but also geographically and, and racially and so on, and having someone like her Work with us is just a great pleasure. All right, great. Well, I think uh, that about does it for us here, but uh, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure, thank you. <laughs>